views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hey everybody, I'm the Dr. Bob Lee. Welcome to Open VXRX. Coming up on today's show, we'll speak to an author and disaster specialist to learn about the survival stories of hurricane victims. And then we'll highlight the journey of an immigrant who overcame tremendous odds to achieve his American dream. After that, well, we'll check in with a returning guest and his business partner to learn about how they are empowering black and brown children. Plus, Bobby C is gonna step into the room with the latest in the world of sports. And then finally, we'll speak to a two-time world famous Apollo Theater winner who will reflect on his career and preview his upcoming performance. All of this and more headed your way because we're wide open. everyone. I'm your host, Dr. Bob Lee, and you're watching Open. It's that live interactive program that brings the Bronx and, well, New York City straight to your TV set. So all you have to do is kick off your shoes and relax your feet and stay right with us. We take you right to social media, BronxNet TV. Now, leading things off, our first guest is an author and an African-American disaster expert. Now, she's specializing in hurricanes. Watch out. And she joins us today to speak about her book, Hurricane Katrina, Mississippi, Black Women Survivors, Resilience, and Recovery, which highlights the experience and the stories of Black women. Black women survivors we're talking about after Hurricane Katrina hit, after it hit Mississippi. So please welcome to the show, Dr. O'Farrah Davis. Doctor, welcome, welcome, welcome. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Bob. Yes. So tell us all about it. You, you, this is a, a, it seems to be an exciting book, but it seems like you were messing around with the title a little bit. So what is that, that true title that you really, really feel in your heart that you want it to be? Yeah. It, thank you so much for asking that question. It's overlooked. Hurricane yeah. Katrina, Mississippi Black Women Survivors Resilience and Recovery. And yeah. that's because, yeah, overlooked. Everybody thinks about Katrina, they think about New Orleans. And New Orleans was hit. Don't get me wrong. And that's but exactly how you women. say it, New Orleans. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. I'm from Mississippi yeah. too. I can tell. <laughs> so um, so what do you want people to know about it? Yeah. So I guess one of the things I want people to know about it is first, I wasn't a disaster scholar before Hurricane Katrina happened. I grew up in Mississippi and I used to take vacations on the Gulf Coast, which is only 45 minutes from New Orleans. And when New Orleans got hit by Katrina, I said something had to happen to my vacation place. So I went down as a researcher and started a study. And when wow. I started the study, yeah, that's how it happened, Dr. Bob. That's what led Just to this like career that. choice? That's Actually, what led to this career choice? That's what led to this project. I've been teaching at the college level for 15, 20 years, but I taught education, I taught mental health, and I taught psychology. I'd never really done anything with disaster studies before 2005. Got it. But since 2005, that is the major research project that I have worked on, and that's 16 years now. Yeah. And does that also include um, the studies of what can happen, say, like in Florida with the building collapse? Because hurricanes can contribute to this, you know, with the, the, the blowing of the sea salt and the corrosion of the beams. I, I don't know. I, I'm just asking you. <laughs> it's a good question. And you know, yeah. I will say this, since Katrina, I have become a storm watcher. So oh. any disaster is a storm now. Yeah. So it's not a storm as far as water coming off the ocean like a hurricane, 
But, you know, as soon as that disaster happened, I wanted to know, oh, my goodness, how could it happen? Because we know why hurricanes happen, but how yeah. could that happen? So what is similar with any disaster is, one, it's either expected or it's not expected. That's first. Two, we can do something to prepare ourselves for it, just like we can with hurricanes, just like we now know with this building collapse. We now know that there could have been some better preparation. So those are two factors that go into any disaster. And then specifically to hurricanes, there's so many other things that people can do to get prepared, such as I started a blog on my website, uh -huh. hurricane season, June 1. That's when hurricane season starts every year. And what I do every week is offer tips of what you can do to get yourself prepared. There yeah. are local agencies you can go to. There's, of course, FEMA, everybody knows that. But there are local agencies you can go to right in your own city to help you get ready to prepare for a disaster right now. Yeah. Ofer, what are some of those other tips that people can, because uh, we even have to prepare all the way, if, even if you're in New York City. I mean, it comes up the coast. It can come from anywhere. Yeah, that's exactly right. So other things you can do. You can go online. You can go to National Hurricane Center. We have our phones in our hands all the time, computers at our fingertips. Just go on. Every single week, National yeah. Hurricane Season shows us there's a storm coming, and this is what you could do to get ready. You can call a church, call a synagogue. There are places ready to help disaster survivors because they already have that in their plans as far as what's yeah. going on in these churches. There are organizations, human services offices. We've all heard of them. Do you know they have right now a, a plan from Texas all the way through up to New York, through Boston, through Maine, right now. Everybody has a hurricane guide. It's available. Yeah. All you and a lot of all human services. You're right. And a lot of the elected, the elected officials have that because they call on me and say, hey, Bob, I want to come on and talk about hurricane preparedness. And uh, exactly. they come on and they, they, they talk about this go bag and all these things. What are some of the things that you need in your go bag? Because sometimes you got to get up and go. That's exactly right. And you know, because I've become a disaster and storm watcher now, I keep one in my car at all times. And I recommend that first. What do you need? You need a blanket. You need flashlight. You need working batteries. So if you put it in there, you yeah. have to change the batteries every six months, just like you do your fire alarm at home. So you put batteries in there. If you can, you put water. Of course, you put some water yeah. in there. You don't have to put a whole big uh, case of it, but six bottles or something something just to have as a start. You know, you can put some packaged food, something you can easily open. Yeah. This is really important. If you have kids or pets, you need to have something there for them. This doesn't have to be a big duffel bag. It can be a small bag because you know now things are packaged so smallly uh, that you can easily just put stuff in a small bag, keep it in your car. But a blanket, flashlight, water. I mean, those are just basic yeah thing. yeah something may happen on the side of the road on a long trip you may need that now That's let's get exactly back into your book what's what's the juicy stuff inside of this book well you know first of all in this book i say that mississippi was overlooked um we had no reporters really very very few uh to go down to mississippi everybody flocked to yeah. new orleans yeah, so that's the first part of the book that I make sure that everybody understands. Another thing, Mississippi, the entire state was declared a disaster area. Yeah, yeah. Not it's below Coast. water. 80,000 miles, wow. square mile, was declared a disaster area. What people don't know is the storm hit New Orleans, but then it came over to Mississippi and what we call in hurricane language, the dirty side of the storm, which means cyclones circulate backwards. So they go backwards, counterclockwise. And so the dirty side of the storm is the worst side of the storm. So the worst side of the storm is what get, hits worse. And as a result of that, Katrina had 
25 feet waves. We call it storm surge that smashed into the Mississippi Gulf Coast. There was lined with casinos and all of those casinos were moved from a barge in the ocean to the interstate, which is about 200 feet. Imagine the power of that storm surge rolling in to yeah. the, um, yeah, it's just unbelievable. So those are the kinds of things that I start off with in the book. But after that- Makes you want to turn the page, huh? <laughs> I definitely <laughs> hope so. So then I start talking about the women in this study. I yeah. went down and I started to interview whomever would be interested in being interviewed because I said, I'm a researcher, I'm from Boston. I live in Boston at that time. And I said, I'm from Boston, I'm a researcher and I wanna get your story. I wanna hear your story. And people start telling me their stories. And I had a digital cassette with me and I audio taped everything. Yeah. And after I did that, I realized that the disaster research did not talk about anything about a certain segment of women from Mississippi. So yeah. I narrowed the study down and I only focused on them and I followed them for 15, wow. 16 years now. Wow. So where can we get your book? Where can we get this wonderful book? And, uh, you know, just give us all the information. Okay. So you can get the book. It's ready and available for pre-order right now on my website at ophiraadavis.com, ophiraadavis.com. You can pre-order it. It will be available August 29th, with this, which is the 16th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina. You will have it in your hand that day or slightly before. And another thing, it's just important to know that um, this story hasn't been told. There are no books on Black women survivors from Katrina. So you can get it. You can get it for your friend. And it's available at ophiraadavis.com. OferraADavis.com, hurricane disaster specialist and author. Congratulations. Thank you so much. And come back again, will you? Because I know we can, we can delve deep into uh, uh, your wealth of knowledge. Very well. I'll be happy to come back. Just let me know. Thank you so you much, it. Dr. Bob. You're welcome. All right, we'll take a break right here. I've got more open next. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. I'm the Dr. Bob Lee from 107.5 WBLS, and you are watching Open. You know, our next guest is an author, and he's with us today to speak about how he overcame discrimination and hate crimes he experienced as a child, which he detailed in his latest book, Go Back to Your Country or Stay and Defy the Arts, and how he used that as motivation to achieve his American dream. So please welcome to the show. Issa Mishabash. Issa, welcome, welcome, welcome. Dr. Bob, thank you so much for having me. I am doing so well. Thank you so much. Now, you come through a whole lot, but you defied all the odds. Tell us about some of the things that, uh, that you've come through as a child. When I got to the United States, uh, I was 12 years old, uh, Dr. Bob, and at that age, uh, we lived in an attic apartment. Uh, and you came here from? We came from Jordan. Jordan, yeah. Jordan. Um, and so we, was my, my, my mother, my, my dad, and my uh, other three siblings all into a, a two-bedroom attic apartment. Uh, at that age, um, I was the tallest sibling. And as a result, I was tasked with getting a job and yeah. a, a 12 year old boy who's tall enough could get away with getting a job <laughs> at a sandwich shop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so I, I got a job uh, and uh, it taught me a lot working at a young yeah. age. I, I learned so much. I, I Working did not mean I, could, I didn't have to go to school. I still had to go to school and then start work right after school and yeah. work uh, weekends. Um, and um, the boss that I had uh, was was tough, was tough. And I, I talk a little about that 
very, very tough. I think for a new kid uh, in this country who's already experiencing rejection uh, in all kinds and all forms, uh, sees that yet again, even in his place of employment. Yeah. Um, but uh, there was this one day, um, Dr. Bob, that I was asked to do a delivery. And this is on Newark Avenue in Jersey City, uh, Newark Avenue and Kennedy Boulevard. Oh, yeah. um, and the, as a 12 year old, I take this delivery. It's, it's, a, it's a cell phone store. I drop off uh, their lunch. They give me $40 and say, keep the change. I put the $40 in my pocket. I start heading back to the store. Uh, as I'm walking back, I heard a swoosh of air from behind me, followed by a tremendous blow to the back of my neck. Well, um, at that point, I fell to the ground. I, I look up and I see a group of kids uh, about 10 feet ahead of me uh, charging down. It looks like they clotheslined me from behind and they were ready to like, finish me off. And I'm thinking, oh boy, they want that $40. Oh my God, they want that $40. And if I don't get this $40 to my boss, who's already tough to begin with, I'm yeah. in trouble. Either way, I need to get this $40 because I need this job. Yeah. So they charge and I, and, I, and I ran towards Kennedy Boulevard. I said, if I could just make it to the corner of Kennedy Boulevard and Newark Avenue, that corner, maybe my boss could see me call the police and I could live to fight another day. Unfortunately, Dr. Bob, I didn't make it to the corner. Right before the corner, uh, I was knocked down. And that's when I was holding one hand on the money in my pocket, yeah. the other hand trying to shield my face. And the, the main uh, assailant was wearing a mask. Uh, like the one Jason wore in the movie Friday the 13th. Oh, boy. So yeah. it was frightening. Yeah. And, 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 and three other kids were with him, and uh, they, they must have been 15, 16 years old, uh, and they were just punching and hitting and kicking everywhere they could. And, and I was just completely outnumbered. I thought that day I was just going to die. And right there, before I was laid into unconsciousness, the gentleman stopped and everybody stopped. The gentleman uh, kneels down and whispers in my ear, or actually shouts in my ear, what sounds like a whisper until this day. <laughs> yeah. And he said, go back to your effing country. Whoa. And walked away. I was able to, to straggle into the door and, and make it back into the store with a bloody smile. I tell my boss, here's your $40. Wow. wow. Before you know it, I was in the hospital and the police were showing me pictures of suspects. All I remembered was the mask. And uh, it turned out that it wasn't a robbery. They didn't even want the $40. They probably didn't even know I had $40. Yeah, yeah, it was it was it's just a, a, a kid that doesn't belong in this country. Let's teach him a lesson and wow. then tell him to go back to his country. So I had a choice. You know, uh, that was a pivotal moment in my life. I'm new to my new country. Uh, yeah. The pride swells in me every time I see that beautiful American flag. Uh, but yeah, at the same time. So that was a, a big motivation uh, for you to go ahead and do the best you can to make it happen in this country, right? It, 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 it was, and, and, and it, was, it, it, it was also confusing because this is, my, what, this is my country. What do you mean when you say go back to your country? So yeah, for a 12 yeah. year old to process that, it's, it's very difficult because you come in, uh, you're thinking, this is your country. You finally reach the land of your dreams. You make it here, and then you're told to go back. But no, this is my, this, and we got here. We got, yeah. we made it, you know? And, and so that, that uh, go back to your country theme kind of stays with you for a while. And until you self-discover, until you realize 
who you are and what you're capable to do. And the opportunities in America are endless for those that could just get beyond the discrimination, get beyond the difficulty of assimilating into the country, the difficulty of, of fitting in, right? So uh, it's, it's, I could have chosen to go back to my country, to abandon the values of this country, the opportunities in this country. Uh, but thank God I had my epiphany at 17. I was headed in the wrong direction. At the age of 16, I really rebelled. I gave my mom many nights where she got on her knees. Well, yeah, well, that's what the adolescent stage is all yeah. about. <laughs> you want to be yeah, an adult, yeah. but you're not there yet, you know. Yeah. So, and then at 16, for me, is finding where do I belong. So I started to gravitate towards the gangster life. I started to gravitate to, to, to places where I felt accepted. And... Uh, lived 18 months of darkness from 16 to about 17 and a half. That's when my mother was on her knees every night praying. One day, you know, the Lord will save this boy and bring him back to his senses. Isa, what are you doing? Isa, Isa, what are you doing? Lord, please let Isa come back. Let him come yes. back. Oh, that, that, that was every night because she had no clue what time I would get home. You know, she's waiting, nine o'clock. 9 30 10 10 30 11 yeah, yeah. anxious there there's no way to get a hold of me so what that broke I would you come home that? alive what broke you out of that actually it was it was i didn't realize it at the time but every time she prayed god was listening god was listening that's right and and so the question is for every mother with a with a child like me can you hold on long enough can you hold on to your prayers long enough? Can you, can you be patient enough uh, and, 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 and you're trusting that there will be a positive outcome? A light and, at the and, end of the tunnel. And a light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. Um, and, and she held on. And, and I, I had my breakthrough uh, in a very random place. I was uh, serving ice cream at Baskin Robbins Dunkin' Donuts yeah. in Jersey City. I was, yeah. you know, 17 and a half at the time. A whole bunch of girls walk in, invite me to go to their youth group. And I'm like, whoa, this is great. <laughs> I bring my friends. We go to a youth group. And in the youth group there, um, I learned that I'm accepted there too. Although my experience with youth groups and churches have been negative in the past, I wasn't accepted because of the way I dressed, the way I spoke. Uh, this time it was different. And it was a small little church in Jersey City that was just loving on that little gangster boy that worked the cross street in Dunkin' Donuts. And they weren't afraid of me. They gave me a hug. They welcomed me. And I found community in the yeah. house of God. And my Com life took a 180 degree turn. Community and communion. And now you have the book. And you didn't write the book about um, business or anything. What did you, what'd you no. write the book about? No, my, my, uh, my biggest... Because you're a very successful uh, businessman. I, I, I thank you for sharing that. I mean, my friends have been after me about writing a business book. Like, Issa, you're a successful entrepreneur. You have uh, 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 multi-million dollar businesses that you, you... We've seen you get there. Can you write about that? And I said, I will one day write about this when the timing is right. But first, I got to tell you how I got here. But Jason was in your ear with that mask. He looked like Jason, right? <laughs> Jason, yep, yep. You're not good enough. Who are you to write a book? You don't belong in this country. You shouldn't even be in all. All the doubts start to come in. But by the grace of God, I wanted to tell that story first before yep. I go out and start writing 100 business books. It turns out that this book has so many business uh, principles you could extract from. But there I just wanted to tell the story, how we got to the U.S. I tell my mother's story in the opening of the book. The first quarter of the book is really how she got to where she is, why she wanted to come to the U.S., her journey to come to the U.S., uh, and, and then it takes off into how I developed and, and, and became who I am today. Well, if you can go back in time, how would you, would you conduct yourself differently? Yeah, if, if I had known uh, what I knew then, I would, I would just take advantage of the opportunities in this country at, at a young age. I would yeah. be a top uh, student 
you know, in seventh grade, eighth grade, all through high school, rather than just waste that precious you time. You would have fixed that adolescent stage, right? Oh yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. I and and um, uh, but I don't live with regrets because yeah. we could turn our lives around at any any stage of our lives. We have the power to turn around, Doctor Bob. Exactly. Where can we get your book? Because they're going to give me a hard wrap right about now. Sure. Uh, go back to your country dot com. Very simple. Go back to your country dot com. You'll learn about the book and everywhere it's sold. There you go, Isa. Mashabash, thank you so much. He's an author. And this is his country. Welcome to America. And maybe we'll go back. We'll go back to visit Jordan. We would love to go there, right? Yes, absolutely. I, I went there in 2019. Uh, I went there in 2012. And uh, hopefully next year we'll take a trip there. As there you a go. Bring, bring the whole uh, um, uh, crew right here from Bronx now, all right? We'll go awesome. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Thank you. Isa, thank you. We appreciate you. We'll take a break right here. I've got more open coming up next. Our next guest are children's authors and visual artists, illustrators, producer, and musician. And they're here today to speak about their Kickstarter effort to fund their latest children's book, I'm Dreaming of a Brown Christmas. So please welcome to the show, Vernon Gibbs II and Stephen T. Gray. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thanks for having thanks. us. Yes, thanks for having us. Yeah, and I, I remember talking to you about the first book. Uh, give us a little uh, update on that book. And uh, I know we were talking about a minivan, the cool minivan and all that stuff. That's right. So um, I'm still cool minivan dad on Instagram. <laughs> so that hasn't changed. Sienna has been doing us well. Um, mm -hmm. We just went on a trip to Williamsburg with the family. So that's been good. But as far as the book, yeah, we were talking about when good fruit goes bad, kind of our first uh, collaborative effort between me and Steve. And it's been great. You know, I've been, it's been out, out since October of 2020, you know, mid pandemic, we kind of launched this book and we sold a little over 1200 copies since then. I've been able to do um, Zoom meetings across the country in California, um, in Florida, in Ohio. So the book has just been a really, you know, a grassroots effort to get more word out about the points yeah. of the book, about eating healthy, creating less waste and kind of knowing your value. So it's yeah. been great. And, um, and, and, and schools want you to bring this in to their, you know, their schools. They want you to talk more about it because, you know, we're supposed to, uh, as children, we grow up and we want the machine, the, the food from the machine, the junk food and all that. But you have a different perspective. Talk about it. Yeah. So I think, um, you know, again, this, this story kind of started just as a little uh, episode that happened with my son throwing out some fruit. And I realized that there's kind of um, a lack of, you know, talking about how to eat healthy and how to create less waste and how to you know put the right foods in your body. You can have a candy yeah. bar every once in a while, but it can't be your main source of, uh, you know, a source of protein or, or not every day. nutrients, not every everything day. in exactly. moderation. Yeah. yeah. Everything in moderation. So that's where this story kind of stemmed from. And it's just grown to be this um, kind of movement to talk about how to eat healthy and how to make healthy choices. And I think it's been great because schools really embrace that. They really want to talk about that and have that more part of curriculum, which is what we're working on for the book going forward and uh, for next year when we do more in person to really talk about how to put healthy things in your body, but also yeah. value what you, your own body and what you're putting in it. It's important. You'll find out later on if you don't find out now, yeah. <laughs> sooner or later. And you have a partner. Way. Yeah, you have a partner, Cuzzo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Steve, yes. how did you get involved? Wow. Uh, well, I've been involved with this guy for his whole life. We're first cousins. <laughs> <laughs> Our mothers are sisters. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, we, we just grew up together. So I love him to death. And we, we have been talking forever about working together because he's just got a lot of talent. He's got a lot of great ideas, very creative. I'm, I'm a musician and an artist, and we just kick ideas off of one another. We've been doing it for years. So finally, we, we settled upon something that we wanted to try to actually do. Uh -huh. Um, so we got ourselves together. We actually created an LLC and um, we came up with an idea. We have a lot of ideas for books, but we came 
and settled on this one for the fruit book. And um, we finally got it done. We just, we just decided that it was a good idea, a good premise, and we just we went for it. And the holidays are a very sentimental time of the season. Is that uh, around that time, did that spark you to uh, move into your second book? Well, um, I guess what happened was because I'm, you know, I'm a singer, so I just happened to be singing one day and I was singing this song, White Christmas, and I just said, oh, wouldn't this be interesting if I kind of changed the lyrics around and wrote a poem about it? And for a long time, I've had, I kind of just it, rolling around in the back of my mind an idea to do a book based on brown and beautiful brown things. Yeah. And um, we, we talked about where the idea for the book came from. And it's, it came from several different places. One of which is when I was younger, all of the holiday things, the Christmas movies and the animations and such, they, they never really represented us. Like I didn't really see brown skinned people in them, you know? And so I kind of yeah. felt we were being left out there. And so, you know, that just kind of always was in the back of my mind, you know, why, why aren't we represented? Um, but I have two daughters and I took them to see a Disney movie called Tangled. Yeah. And of course I love Disney. I'm an artist and an animator and I love it. And so I went and I was all excited and I went and I sat there and there's one scene in the movie where the protagonist, he takes Rapunzel into a bar where there's a lot of drunk men and, you know, kind of dirty men or whatever. And he makes a comment that's something along, along the lines of, it smells like the color brown in here. And that wow. just kind of, it really hurt me. I was appalled that they would even allow that line to remain in. Yeah. The um, um, just to make a long story short, we got up, we left, but it never left my mind that they would say something like that. And so, you know, being a kid and all those experiences and that, you know, um, combined just made me want to do something that said, you know, brown is a beautiful color. Oh yeah. And brown and, and so the, the Christmas thing just was a natural kind of pairing of those ideas just to say, yeah. you know, all the beautiful things, brown things that we love, the food we eat, the, the people we see in their skin colors. So you wrote about it, you sang about it, you did the illustration about it, you dreamt about it. Yes. And um, I, I, I don't know if Vernon, Vernon, can you sing too? Um, I can sing with a lot of people <laughs> around me. I'm, that kind of, I'm, a, I'm a tenor. <laughs> so yeah, there you go. I, can, <laughs> I can find the note if you need me to, but I need yeah. at least three or four backups behind me. Not all like right, Steve, okay. <laughs> Stephen, Stephen, you kick it off, all right? Okay. You want me to sing some of it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm dreaming of a brown Christmas. That's what you're going to sing or, or what? Oh, sure. I'm dreaming of a brown Christmas. Christmas. Just like the ones, <laughs> the ones I, I used to know. <laughs> All right, All right here's what we do. Now. Here's what we do. Wait, wait, wait. Here's what we do. Here's what we do right here. Um, Stephen, you start off with I'm dreaming of a brown Christmas and then uh, uh, Vernon, you come up just like the ones I used to know, ready? Okay. Not together because it'll come out crazy, oh, okay. right? Right, Stephen, well, my, one, okay, my lyrics are different though. I changed the lyrics. All right, that's yeah. all right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but the book, yeah, the, yeah, the book is very different, yeah. <laughs> that's okay. I'll but we'll, right we'll sing the, the traditional book. version. We'll sing the traditional version. All right, okay, here we go. I'm dreaming of a white Christmas, just like the ones I used to know. <laughs> Don't get us started. Don't get us started. <laughs> the sun to hear sleigh bells in the snow. We're not doing a whole song. <laughs> that, <laughs> okay. I'm just, there you go. <laughs> so in, in the book, um, Vernon, in the book, it's different. Explain that. Yeah, so I mean, the, um, the book really, again, Steve talks a lot about the kind of inspiration for the book. And the book just highlights all the beautiful brown things that we see at Christmas. So yeah. while it um, takes on the form of the kind of how you sing the song, you know, it's written words. So it just kind of takes some of those same elements of the song and changes them around. Some of the, the people you see, um, the foods you eat, the presents you get, and just highlights all the, you know, the scenes that you would see at Christmas time, but, you know, full of brown people, you know, people of all shades, you know, we kind of all come from different shades of brown. So I think it's great that the book, um, while it has a lot of beautiful people of color, it has people across the spectrum. So I think that's what makes this book so um, so great because the images are just beautiful and vibrant and it just highlights what Christmas is about and the people that you're with, um, the foods that you eat and the memories that you have that usually come with Christmas time. 
I mean, we could talk about Christmas in July. It's exactly. It's fun. Yeah, because it's an all year thing when you're putting out uh, wonderful things like this that children children can grasp hold of. And, it, you know, it's Christmas every day for children. You know that. <laughs> Where's my toy? Where's my gift? Mom, yeah. give me a hug. I have, three, love. I have three kids, so anytime they go to you know a store, they think it's Christmas. And I'm yeah, like, I don't, that's have, right, I don't right. have Christmas money, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Give me a couple of weeks. So so this is wonderful. And then you have something called the Kickstarter Fund. This is going to help out. Talk about that. Uh, um, Vernon, you can probably start out with it. Yeah. So um, the Kickstarter, as a lot of people you know may or may not know, is an all or nothing venture. So essentially, you put out a product that you're trying to um, get funding for because you can't always you know go into your own pocket or you don't have the funds to make something happen and yeah. we said with this book um we really want to have the crowdfunding aspect because people really love to be involved in making a project come to life and that's what's been happening so far we, we've been running it since um about two or three days ago since july uh, no, i'm sorry since uh, june early june late june we started running it it's going to end on uh july 13th so it's a pretty short kickstarter but that's okay um, yeah, but you know what? It's it's a, a great a great cause because you know Christmas in July is important because if you want to get something printed, especially with a book, you need to do it really early to exactly. get it for the holidays. So that's why we're running it now, and the support has been has been really great. We were just named a project that Kickstarter loves, which is a tag that they give to only to a handful of projects that they really see and want to get behind. So yeah. it's yeah, it was great to get that honor just within hours of posting posting it on live on Kickstarter. A couple hours later, I get an email saying we picked this as a project we love. So we're really happy with the outpouring of support. And with anything like this, you need as many people to support as possible. Friends and family are great, but people that we don't know, we want to buy. We want them to, um, you know, help pledge to have this happen. And that's how these things really get big. So we're hoping that we can get a yeah. great outpouring of support going forward. Stephen, how can people uh, get into the book? How can they buy it? Uh, and when will it be launched? Will it be launched just before Christmas or? Yes, we're, we're hoping to have the, um, the books printed. Um, it takes about two months or so to have the books printed and returned to us. And we're going to be going with a fulfillment company. Um, we're looking at probably Amazon, but we have a couple of others that we haven't, we haven't tied it down yet, but we're looking, looking at Amazon so that you'll probably be able to get it through Amazon and probably yeah. other book, tail, uh, book retailers as well. Sounds um, good. Yeah. And uh, is there a website? What website can we go to to find out all about all the wonderful things that you guys well, are doing? Yeah. Illustration, publishing, um, yeah. the books and everything that you're, you're doing. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're doing a little bit of it all. We're doing, again, animation. We're working on some original music around the book. Um, we've been working with um, Bully and the Foundation to really um, help us market this and connect us with you, which has been amazing. And um, the best place people can go is if they just go to Kickstarter and type in, I'm dreaming of a brown Christmas, it'll pop up as one of their um, products we love, but also they'll be able to go right to the link. So that's the best place to go. Go to Kickstarter, put in, I'm dreaming of a brown Christmas, it'll pop up, there'll be a beautiful image of the, the um, kid that's in the background and a great <laughs> video that highlights what the Kickstarter is about. And um, it's gonna be, you know, we really hope that we can get the support we need to kind of cross that, that threshold so we can get the printing done in time for Christmas and get it into people's hands as soon as possible. Um, we're doing some animation, we're doing music around it. We just have a lot going on. So we hope this is Beautiful. gonna be the first of quite a few projects from Cuzzo's uh, Media going forward. There you go. Well, thank you guys for stopping by. And uh, you know, you're, you're, you're family now. So you're always welcome to stop <laughs> in and, and break some bread with us and give our love to the Bullion Foundation, Sandra DeCosta and the crew, okay? Of course. Yeah, thank you. We've got to take a break. You guys involved in sports? You're watching the games and everything? The Absolutely. playoffs? <laughs> because <laughs> Bobby C is up next he's on deck with the latest in the world of sports next on Open Good morning, sports fans. Coming up next, we've got part one of our interview with Yankee beat reporter and author Brian Hoke. But first, let's take a look at another story from Yankees Hope Week. 
The team shed light on the increase of anti-Asian hate crimes that plague our country. In the process, the Yankees have given a voice to victims of anti-Asian discrimination. Here's more from Hope Week. It's been nice not only to feel the AAPI community, but be accepted by the Yankee family. And Yankees being a representation of New York feels like a big moment to celebrate, um, you know, something bad that we're trying to make good with all of New York City in a nice way. So we're really honored to be here and um, enjoy this experience. We would have never dreamed that this would have come about today. And it's just been a pleasure and it's been so moving to see um, how a project that we created just has been so impactful to such an important group of people. Mm -hmm. It's been wonderful so far. I feel I am welcome. I feel that I belong. I feel that it's one great family and I belong to this family. And it's so, I'm so happy that I am here experiencing all these things. I hope this just brings awareness. Um, I think the Yankees, of course, have such an amazing audience and a diverse group of people and really show the true breadth and representation of what America is, um, just with what even we have in New York City. So I think it sets an example and a tone for the, hopefully the rest of the country to see um, and sheds a light on this very important issue that unfortunately, you know, happened to my mom under the scope of our AAPI community, but it's really about hate being not okay in any form, and it's about every demographic of people, and no one should feel um, different for any discrimination for any characteristic because we're all American. And now the latest on the Yankee Beat. MLB.com Yankees Beat reporter and now three-time author Brian Hoke joins us this morning. Brian, scorching weather here in the Big Apple, but unfortunately the Yankees not playing so hot. Yeah, no doubt about it. Um, you know, they, it's been an uphill climb for this team. And, you know, for a team that a lot of us picked to win the division, to go on and make some noise, make a run at that 28th World Series title, they've really just been spinning their wheels. And it's kind of one step forward, one step back. And so I, I'm not saying it's too late for them to make a run, but this American League East is such a tough division with – Boston and Tampa Bay and Toronto's not going anywhere. And um, yeah, no, the Yankees definitely have their work cut out for them. And if they're going to uh, get back to the playoffs and be the team that we expected them to be. Well, Brian, Yankees might not be such good news, but you've got some good news to share with our fans at home this morning. And of course, as I just mentioned, you now have a third book out and it appropriately called the Bronx zoom inside the New York Yankees most bizarre season this 2020 season. Tell us a little bit about the book. Yeah, I, I really wanted to capture how strange that 2020 season was because it, I've covered the Yankees since 2007. I can't compare it to anything. And so I was with the Yankees in spring training when everything shut down on March 12. They played and they told us, well, opening day will be delayed by at least two weeks. And fast forward and it's July and the Yankees are playing opening day in an empty ballpark. And, uh, you know, the, there were only 35 media members allowed in the ballpark every day. And I was one of them. I went to every single game at Yankee Stadium last year. And it was the strangest thing ever. You would walk in. It was like post-apocalyptic. The concession stands were closed. Uh, there was no, no energy in the building. And you'd make that turn and you'd see the lights are on at 7.05. And the Yankees would come out in their pinstripes. And you'd think, who are they playing this game for? Is it for me? And so uh, obviously it wasn't. It was for the people at home and it gave everybody something to, to watch and enjoy. But it was just bizarre. And it made me really appreciate the energy and the passion that the fans have and they bring to the to the game. You know, I remember seeing you on opening day for 2020. And, it, and like you said, just such a, a bizarre, bizarre scene at Yankee Stadium. I mean, for the Yankees to now have their their brand new prize and Garrett Cole take the mound, their ace pitcher at the ballpark and have, you know, sounds being brought in through the sound system and, uh, you know, for the fans, just, just remarkable. I think last year, if I recall for that opening day, when we got to go and I saw you in the press box, I think there was maybe, maybe 15 reporters for that very first game and not yeah. being able to move in the press box. I mean, trying to describe it to people, I would say, unlike any other Yankee game I've ever covered. Yeah, and a lot of it wasn't fun. It was a very heavy year in a lot of ways. Look, we were all wearing masks. We're, there was great uncertainty about uh, what we were all experiencing, but also uncertainty if the season would survive. I mean, there was a period where the Yankees, I, I talk about this in the book, the Yankees are 
in Philadelphia for a series and it's 95 degrees, beautiful summer weather, kind of like what we're having now. And they're technically getting rained out every single day because the Phillies had possible COVID exposure to the Marlins who had 18 guys on their roster test testing positive. And, you know, I remember talking to guys at the time and also later who were like, yeah, this isn't going to work. Like this season's not going to happen. And uh, that was the time they were stranded in Baltimore. They, uh, uh, they in Philadelphia and they were going to come back to New York and just have workouts again at Yankee stadium. And somebody came up with a bright idea and said, Hey, you know, the Orioles are in the same situation we are. Why don't we just turn the bus to Baltimore and go play against them? And it was kind of like backyard pickup baseball where it's like, hey, we heard there's a team down the street that wants to play a game. Can we go play against them? But this was Major League Baseball in 2020. And just the strangest season that uh, I ever experienced, the players, coaches, executives, anybody could have imagined. And we try to do you right, too, this morning on the show because we're having our interview being done actually on zoom which i think is appropriate <laughs> for, uh, for the book now i know our older yankee fans might recall of course the 1978 championship season and uh, the nickname of the yankees as the bronx zoo sparky lyle he ended up writing a book actually sure. with the same title and and you do a nice job here with the play on words of course with the bronx zoom definitely provides an intimate and engaging look behind the scenes i thought it was also fitting that you actually picked Garrett Cole to do the forward for the book because I think his press conference in February of 2020 to me was the last real major event that as reporters here in New York that we covered before what what feels like the world ended at that time in March. Yeah, no, and definitely. I mean, you had such optimism for what his arrival in New York was going to do. He was the great white whale, as Brian Cashman called him. Uh, you know, this lifelong Yankee fan who finally got a chance to wear the pinstripes, came with the biggest contract ever given. And, you know, it was the last kind of vestige of the before times really oh the Yankees signed the best pitcher out there of course they did that's what they do that's they're the New York Yankees and uh you know getting to know Garrett a little bit in spring training was good and I, I thought he was going to be a great fit in New York and then the plug just got completely pulled on March 12 and uh in the book we kind of chronicle I, I anchored a lot on Garrett and just his experience in what he had to do to kind of stay ready for the season he was ready to be on the mound April 1st in New York. Instead, he's playing catch with his wife in the front yard of their house in Connecticut, their new house where they still haven't unboxed everything yet. And, um, you know, there were a lot of days where Aaron Boone would come over and play catch with him. But this is your big prize pitcher. And suddenly he's got no games to pitch in. So uh, this was a year unlike certainly he could have imagined. I mean, he used to be 11 years old in his bedroom in California with pictures of Derek Jeter and Andy Pettit on the wall saying, I'm going to be like those guys, but he never thought it would be like that. You know, I remember when we got a chance to talk a little bit about the other books, you know, the, the baby bombers and of course, co-authoring mission 27, you know, when you consider that the Yankees had to navigate this season amidst, amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, and then of course, historic movements for social equality and social justice. And then, and then I, I would say this, this uh, presidential election that will go down in history, how challenging was it in comparison to the other books to try to chronicle, like we said, a year unlike any other uh, in this new book? Yeah, it was definitely part of it. I don't think you could tell the story of 2020 without touching upon Black Lives Matter, social justice, the presidential election, Trump versus Biden. Like It was just such a part of our day-to-day -day life, the pandemic, of course. And so um, more than the other books, more than any other year I've covered baseball, real life intersected with the sports world. And they were just, you couldn't separate the two. It is a baseball book, but it's also a book about 2020 and the experience we all went through together. Everybody had strong opinions on a lot of issues, topics, uh, the Yankees where, you know, on the cover of that book, you have Aaron Judge wearing a Black Lives Matter t-shirt, the John Carlos Stanton and Aaron Hicks kneeling in the outfield during that first series in, in Washington, D.C. You can't tell the story of baseball in 2020 without telling the story of 2020. Tune in next Monday for part two. We built a media network for you. Bronxnet TV. Come learn in your new state-of-the-art studios at Lehman College. At Mercy College. And coming soon to the South Bronx in the Hub. Inspire with your stories, culture, history. Your Bronx on Bronxnet. Engage with us. Connect with us at your channels and at Bronxnet.tv. Learn. Engage. Inspire. Bronxnet TV. From the Bronx to the world. <laughs> Bronxnet. <laughs> 
Welcome back, everybody. I'm the Dr. Bob Lee from 107.5 WPLS and our fantastic channel right here, Open. We've got it going on for you. It's a show that uh, we've been doing for some time. And our next guest is a singer and a songwriter, and he joins us to speak about his career and to preview his upcoming performance at the showboat Atlantic City. <laughs> now, watch out because it's going to be spectacular. So please welcome to the show, Don Connor. Don, welcome. What's up? How you doing, Dr. Bob Lee? What's up, man? Good to see you. Nice to see you, too. I heard you've been doing a whole lot, man, and we're looking forward to seeing you out there in Atlantic City. Yeah, man, it's been uh, it's been busy, and, and I don't mind being busy. It's been good. It's been busy. Uh, yeah. It's a blessing, man, out there really and you, doing And you shared the stage. You're Trini from the bone, but you're, you're from the States, but you shared the stage with so many people, Anthony Hamilton and... and uh, uh, Life Jennings, uh, Drew Hill, uh, yeah. Kindred, you name it. You, you've been you've been there. Yeah. And been yeah. You're a world famous Apollo Theater winner. Yes, two times, two times, yeah. man. That's yeah. good. That's, That's good. Special. That up there with Monique. Good. Yeah, because yeah. you know how you know how tough the uh, the Apollo Theater crowd is. It's that audience, crowd. they're relentless. They're looking to boo some people now. Well, I, <laughs> I, didn't give, right I didn't thing. give them any time. They didn't get a chance to boo. They didn't get a chance. I know, because I used to host that thing over there. Oh. The Apollo Theater Amateur yeah. Night. So I, I I know how, I've seen people run out. Somebody came in from Ohio, they booed them, they dropped the mic as soon as they opened up their mouth, and they ran out, and we never oh. saw them again. But yeah. you can't quit, because quitters never win, and winners never quit. Right. And here right. we are. Look at you. Look at you. Hey, the great things, man. Me. Thanks. They didn't get a chance to boo me. <laughs> they didn't get a chance. They loved it from, from the gate. So when I walked out, yeah. You know, the trick was the trick was as soon as most artists wait for the music to come on, yeah. I totally forgot uh, it was a show and walked out with the microphone already singing. So they heard me behind the curtains before I even yeah. got the stage. So that's what got them. Yeah, that's what's up. And, and when they hear a good voice, they know they're gonna leave you alone throughout the whole thing. And Absolutely. some people recover if they don't start out right. You know, they may be cracking in the beginning and. Then the clapping start coming in yeah, and they absolutely. overshadow the booze. Yeah, absolutely. But no fear, no fear. No fear. There you no go. No fear, but no fear. Now you are performing with an original band, a legendary yeah. original band. How did that yeah. come about? Yeah, uh, actually I was out in um, Philly one day and I visited a club. I did an open mic uh, yeah. and Wawa, the great Wawa Legrand. Yeah. And uh, my brother, uh, who's very good friends with Wawa, I said, listen, I just want this guy to come up. I just, he didn't even introduce me as his brother. I just want the guy to come up, do a song. So Wawa said, yeah, let me just hear him. So they gave me the spotlight. And from there, I took off with one of Teddy's joints. Um, what? Uh, I just took off. And actually, the original drummer and Wawa was there. But the other guys who sat in was still like, whoa. And ever since then, man, it's just been love, nothing but love. They met you at the bottom of the steps, huh? They said, hey. Yeah, yeah. And I, <laughs> and I, and I climbed up. I climbed up, Dr. B. I climbed up. <laughs> so let me get up. But it, it was nice. It was cool. Uh, yeah. The crowd, uh, you know, again, the ladies, like we discussed, the ladies, they did. They threw up some garments, which was really nice. <laughs> 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 I know, man. I know. I've been to a Teddy Pendergrass show. Now you were you were dealing with the original members of the Teddy Pendergrass the original, band. Yes, that that's that's uh, you know, each time I think about it, it's just it's just a blessing just to be up there. You know, I even went back and I looked at some old films on the same guys. Yeah, uh, and these guys look good today. They're they're still sharp today. They're still tight uh, with one another, musician wise. I, I mean. I don't have to look back on stage. These guys yeah. are so charmed, man. But it's a what, blessing just to be up there. Yes, it is. What song did you sing that intrigued them? Uh, uh, Latest and Greatest. Oh. Latest and Greatest. I did, too. I did Latest and Greatest and actually Come On and Go With Me. You know, you know what part did you feel that you knew they were out? Did you, you, did you know they were out there? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, did I know that the, 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 the original band was out there? Yeah, yeah. The band well, member. Wawa, I, Wow, I, I did somewhat knew of him. Yeah. Until he got, I gave him a solo. I did, I did my normal. I just said, let me hear the guitar player. And he gave me more than was, ex, was, was expected. And I was like, wow. 
Yeah. And then so I got Wawa, Wawa was probably talking about you. Yo, man, you got to hear this cat. You know, he was talking yeah, about that's, that's his the original band members. That's his yeah. personality. Yeah, he actually did that. He, he told me. Yeah. I talked about you from then, and that was it. Yeah. Now, what part were you feeling when you knew that you had them? What, what, what part? Hit when I part did, part. When, when, when I got to the part where uh, you just keep on lifting me up, girl. Oh, yeah. All right. Oh, oh, oh. So when I get to those, yeah, meaty. That's the meat of the song. So you know yeah, that exactly, it's the meat of the exactly. song. They sing with me. If I get crowd participation, oh, it's lovely. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah, and, and that's what happened. Yeah, and 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 throwing delightful things onto the stage. Yeah, beautiful, delightful thing. Beautiful, <laughs> beautiful garments. <laughs> nice garments. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so you're yeah. going to be performing in Atlantic City. Tell us yes. about it. Uh, that's August 21st. Uh, big showdown in, at Atlantic City. Um, in fact, uh, this will be one of the third uh, biggest show that we had. Um, I'll be I'll be hitting Caesars Palace as well. So I got a lot of up and coming shows, big shows. Yeah. Uh, I'm actually down there this Saturday along uh, just going to see a good friend of mine, Brian McKnight. So Brian performs Saturday oh, yeah, yeah. with him. So I'm going to end up staying down there for a couple of days and then coming back. But, you know, it, I enjoy it, man. I enjoy it. Tell Brian I said hello. So I used to yes. play ball with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a good ball player. <laughs> and yeah. I was talking about him last night. We was playing Queen Latifah's team. And this wow. girl came down and dunked on everybody, and everybody wow. in the bleachers fell out on onto the floor. Just oh, oh like about a month ago, I sat. Yeah. <laughs> me, me, me and Latifah sat together about a month ago. Good uh -huh. friend, good friend. Yeah. So we sat. She's excited. Uh, That's good. That's again, good. you know, it's a blessing, man. You know. So we were looking forward to seeing you. You know, I want to sit in the audience and say, y'all. Yeah. Hey, listen, That's I it, got right you. There. Cause I know the music is going to be the same and the oh, guys are going to be the same, the original guys. And then you're going to come oh, in yeah. and drop your voice in the cut like that. Boom. Yeah. We go, we're going, I'm going hard. I'm going hard with come on and go with me. Uh, turn off the light, close the door. Is it still good to you? We uh, go, we, we're going, we, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take them to uh, get up, get down, get funky, get loose. There you go. Yeah. We're going hard. I'm going hard. I'm going hard. All right. Hey, thank you so much, man. And we'll be looking forward to seeing more of you. Thank you. All Appreciate right. you, Dr. Brown. Don Connor, lead singer, that big Philadelphia band. What's it called? Teddy Pendergrass Band. That's it. It's Don Connor and the LeGrand Band. There you go. All and right. He, and Bob Lee, I got you. If you're coming, I got you. You got it. We're going to hook something up. We're going to hook something up for sure. Got you. Thank you. Thank you for All having right. me. Don Connor doing his thing and he's going to be singing his tail off and we're going to go check him out. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today's show. I want to thank our guests for joining us and you all viewers for tuning in and checking it all out. You can follow us on BronxNet TV for continued coverage. And thank you so much for letting us share in this space and time with you. Always remember this, what you are is God's gift to you and what you make of yourself is your gift to God. So choose your choice and let your choice control the chooser. For all of us here at BronxNet, have a great and enjoyable day. And I'll see you over 107.5 WVLS. I love you all. Peace.